We are the Church of the Larger Fellowship, a Unitarian Universal congregation with no geographical boundary, working toward creating a global spiritual community rooted in profound love, which cultivates wonder, imagination, and the courage to act. Adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic has been difficult for many bricks and mortar congregations. Early on in the pandemic, we were in a unique position to assist many congregations with the transition. We hosted special episodes of The View, provided advice and counseling to religious professionals, and trained congregations for live streaming worship, all while providing robust online programming for our members. From worship to covenant groups, from classes to pastoral care, and from our monthly magazine to our letter writing ministry, we have found ways to build connection and community even through the screen. We have been a model for ministry on the margins, providing services for isolated Unitarian Universalists, becoming a spiritual lifeline for our members in prison, and investing in innovative ministry. We know better than anyone how deep and meaningful connections can be formed even from a distance. Unitarian Universalists have faced many challenges in these times, and we continue to persevere and to fight for justice and equity for all people, especially during moments of crisis. We are proud to be a leader in this faith movement, and we invite you to get involved in our ministry. We strive to be a place where anyone from anywhere can find spiritual refuge anytime they need it. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Larger Fellowship. We are so excited to bring you an all new episode of The View. The View is a weekly Unitarian Universalist talk show discussing important faith-based topics from an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, and multicultural perspective. Every Thursday for the past seven years, we have welcomed guests from every corner of the world. Our guests are writers, scholars, activists, and religious thought leaders who are shaping Unitarian Universalism and society for the 21st century and beyond. I hope today's show inspires you hope it builds your faith, hope it gives you perspective to see the power of Unitarian Universalism at work in your life. Enjoy the message. Hola, mi gente. Hello, everybody out in Unitarian Universalist land and beyond. How are you? Welcome to the Voices of Unitarian Universalism, The View, brought to you by the Church of the Larger Fellowship. We are so excited that you are here today to talk about um, some of our favorite principles, our seventh and eighth principles, and the connection between them. And before we start on that, though, we do our usual um, roundup of our hosts. So I am Christina Rivera. I am one of the co-leads of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. And I'm coming to you from Puerto Rico, where it is beautiful and um, not too steamy, which is nice because it can get really, really humid here. How about you, Michael? Hola, Chris. Uh, this is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York, a little bit north of New York City, where it is a bright, clear, beautiful fall uh, day, and um, I am looking forward to uh, taking my child to the playground and just spending some time under the bright yellow tulip poplar trees this afternoon. Um, it's uh, it's good to be here. Uh, yeah. we, we send our love to Dawn Fortune, um, our usual co-host, um, who who is not feeling uh, so great today. Um, I wore I wore my best flannel shirt for them, um, and then they're not here, uh, so. Uh, it's it's good to be it's good to be with you. So glad. And um, in place of our usual UU roundup uh, today, I thought I'd do a roundup from Charlottesville. So uh, as many of you know, um, my um, other ministry home is in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
I was there during 2017 Unite the Right rally as the clergy presence um, for the counter protest of the white supremacists. And this week in Charlottesville, um, a uh, landmark case is, is being heard, uh, which seeks to hold the organizers of the Unite the Right rally um, in accountable in one way um, for the uh, violence that they um, encouraged, perpetrated, all of that kind of thing. So um, there is a group of plaintiffs who have brought civil action against the Unite the Right um, uh, co-conspirators and, and organizers. And that trial has begun. And so we have, um, again, experienced in Charlottesville a um, descending of the world press um, to try and figure out um, what Charlottesville is doing and what, what it's like to be in Charlottesville right now. And one of the things that, um, that we really want folks to remember is to keep their eye on the prize, right? Like the ultimate um, goal is to have liberation, um, not necessarily a legal process holding somebody civilly accountable um, because we know that process is flawed, flawed in many ways for many people. And while it's important to, um, to try and establish their legal accountability, um, it's equally or more important to establish um, our moral accountability. And so we want to really encourage people to look at their daily lives and look at their daily practice. One of the things we get asked by the press all the time is, is there going to be a rally in Charlottesville to show support for the plaintiffs? And, and no, because what the plaintiffs were doing was putting their privilege and power on those days on the line to protect those that were less vulnerable. And that's what we want people to be doing, to examining, to be examining their lives, to know um, where the areas are in their lives that they can be putting, that you can be putting um, your privilege and power to work um, to protect those that are more vulnerable. So that's what's going on in Charlottesville. And um, the trial is expected to last a couple weeks. So I expect that I'll have uh, some kind of update for you all maybe next week. Our hearts are definitely uh, with, with the good people of Charlottesville. And, you know, and with you for doing that ministry. Um, and I hope that the press captures um, the breadth and depth of the community in Charlottesville um and and the love and justice that people are seeking we are hoping so too absolutely but today we are super excited here on the view to talk about the seventh and eighth principle and we have guests with us we have ali clark yay um is the director of programs and partnership at the unitarian universalist ministry for earth also known as uumfe because we love our acronyms. Um, she manages the denomination-wide Create Climate Justice Initiative and is a member of the UUA Side with Love organizing strategy team. Yay! Allie lives in Austin, Texas, and is a member of the Wildflower UU Church. She's also a core volunteer with the Festival Beach uh, Food Forest, which is an edible and medicinal landscape on public parkland in East Austin. That sounds really interesting, as well as Serafina Food Pantry. And also joining us is Paula Cole Jones, who many of you know is a lifelong Unitarian Universalist and a management consultant with over 20 years experience designing and facilitating workshops and dialogues for leaders and organizations. She is an innovator in institutional change. That's like saying a lot in a little short sentence because that is certainly true. In 1999, Paula founded ADORE, which stands for A, Dialogue on Race and Ethnicity. And her work includes being a leader in advancing the eighth principle and communities of commun community of communities as practices of the beloved community. Paula is an author of You Your World magazine cover story, Reconciliation as a Spiritual Discipline. 
She's also editor of a Skinner House book, which is called Encounters, Poems About Race, Ethnicity, and Identity, and is also a contributing author to three Skinner House books, including the UUA Common Read, Justice on Earth. Welcome, Paula and Allie. We're so excited y'all are here. Yay! So I'll start with the, the first, maybe, I wanted to say obvious question, but maybe it's not obvious. What do you all see as the intersection between the seventh and eighth principle? Paula, you wanna start us out? Yeah, you know, I was thinking as you were doing your introductions that we probably should say what those principles are. And um, Allie has a version of the eighth principle behind her. Uh, but the seventh principle is our respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we all are a part. The eighth principle is, um, it, it speaks to us being on a spiritual journey by building a multicultural, diverse, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and oppression in ourselves and in our institutions. So I just wanna put the principles out there. Uh, there certainly is a direct connection between the two principles. And I wanna say in a, in a space or in a world where colorblindness is uh, kind of the status quo, we can have our principles and we can have the seventh principle uh, respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we all are a part. Um, but that principle won't necessarily include all of the people and the perspectives that are a part of that interdependent web of existence. Uh, in fact, I share with people, it was the seventh principle that just made me so keenly aware that we needed something else because for some of us, that interdependent web of existence also includes this very diverse, multicultural, uh, not just community, but world in which we live. But that doesn't translate that way for everyone, right? For some people, the seventh principle is about the environment. And so you can have situations where we, we make um, heroic efforts to save animals, while there are people who are in great need and, um, and that can just be left out of the equation if we interpret the seventh principle as environment. The other piece about that is that we will not have healthy human communities unless we have a healthy, sustainable environment and vice versa. So there is a, a direct relationship for all of us being the way that we use the land, and our natural resources, and our own well-being and longevity, actually. Ellie, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Thank you, Paula, for starting us off. Um, one thing, so ministry, UU Ministry for Earth, we are committed to grounding our work in environmental justice, meaning looking at um, racism and classism and other oppressions and how they play into the way that we interact with as human beings and exploit the environment or, um, you know, within our, our economic paradigm have created these intersecting issues where um, the communities that are the most polluted, the most poisoned, the most dangerous to live in are those of communities of color and low income people of all races and, and ethnicities. Um, so at Ministry for Earth, we find the, you know, in order to really take a Unitarian Universalist approach to respect for the web of life, we can't ignore those connections. Uh, we have to ground, if we're really grounded in our faith principles and how we do our environmental work, then this needs to be a lens at which we build the community and organize among each ourselves and each other and in relationship to those who are most affected to do environmental work, to do climate work. And so that's, you know, one of the key ways that these things are interconnected. Um, one of my favorite words in the eighth principle is accountability. Um, you know, and what is that, what does it mean to be accountable? 
Um, that's really, really important, both when we think about doing multicultural justice work um, and also in how we think about our relationship to the earth. So um, I, I got into climate and environmental activism almost 10 years ago in 2012 with the tar sands blockade fighting the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and I had come from um, a very privileged corporate suburb of Dallas where there was really no, um, no education, no grounding for me in what environmental justice and environmental racism was about. So I really jumped in the deep end and got a crash course in uh, these issues by, by finding myself on one end, on the southern end of a pipeline that was poisoning First Nations, the Athabasca Chippewa Nation with the Alberta tar sands in Canada, as well as the communities in Houston um, where these refineries live. And part of the ethos of that campaign was to be accountable to these communities in how we worked and to be accountable to the land, that these are neighborhoods and, and people who are deeply um, rooted in where they are. And that was a completely new concept for me. So I, I, it really transformed my life to ask that question, like, what, what, what place am I accountable to and what community am I accountable to? Um, and it changed the way I oriented to where I live in Texas and, and my commitment to both land-based struggles and, and community justice struggles. Um, so that, that's where I would kind of go with that question. How are these things connected? And um, I also want to lift up that I think it was four days ago that on the 24th, I believe, was, yes, the 24th of October in 1991 was the first National People of Color Leadership Summit in 1991 uh, that established environmental justice principles for policy in the United States. So it's been 30 years that convergence was done in partnership with the United Church of Christ, and they've been, you know, a leader for three decades in um, really helping people see these intersections between environment and um, race, race and class justice issues. So um, I just want to celebrate how far we've come in the past 30 years. Uh, the fact that we have just had that anniversary and, and also just name that they, we still have so far to go in um, reaching environmental justice in all our relations. And let me say too that um, regarding environmental justice, BIPOC communities had to fight and still do have to fight for environmental justice, just like civil rights and everything, everything else that you cannot take it for granted. We have to fight for it. We have to work to sustain it. That needs to change. And if we are really living out our principles and if we are living out the eighth principle in addition, then we do that work. So when you talk about accountability, um, Allie, it, it's interesting because for some people, accountability is the one piece of the eighth principle that um, is problematic. And for others, that's where the real power is. And thank goodness there are a lot more people who, who um, are inspired by having a principle that really calls us into action. So it's not enough just to think, you know, good things about inclusion and fairness. You've got to do something about it. And our principles really do call us into it. Let me say one more thing. You talked about 30 year, a 30 year anniversary. Next year is the 25th year since the Unitarian Universalist Association uh, voted to become an anti-racist association. That should be a big year for us. But think about that. 25 years is a long time. We just got to do this. We got to make it happen. So, you know, just listening to you all talk about this, um, one of the things I love is when parts of our principles uh, feed off of and inform each other. And sometimes that's internal to principles, right? So, like freedom and responsibility uh, in our search for truth and justice uh, balance each other in a certain way. And I'm just, I'm thinking about the ways in which 
interdependence and accountability mm -hmm. um, feed off of one another? What is how how is accountability changed if we also recognize our interdependence? And how is interdependence changed when we recognize our need to be accountable to those who have less institutional power than we do? Yeah, Michael, you're almost naming, I think, a spiritual aspect of the difference between exclusion and inclusion. You know, how do you have interdependence if you're not inclusive? The eighth principle is about our, our commitment to doing the work of justice and inclusion. And I wonder if you could speak, Paula, a little bit more about what accountability actually looks like in congregation and community, because um, I think that's that's one of um, the the parts of the eighth principle that I think folks sometimes get stuck on. Um, so, yeah, and I'll ask Ali to um, to speak to this as well. So first, I think we have to um, disarm, in a sense, the word accountability. And I look at it as accountability is what we measure, why we measure it, and how we measure it, right? What we measure, why we measure it, and how we measure it. Now, that can be applied anywhere. So the word accountability in itself is not loaded. What's loaded is what people project onto that word. And if, if, if a person is holding accountability as some kind of punishment or something like that, then yeah, there might be a reaction to accountability. But in the justice arena, and all of you know this, accountability is our working in right relationship with people who are collaborating, people who are, are usually more negatively impacted by an action, decisions, policies, whatever. So accountability is that we don't come to the table as though we have the answers. But we come to the table uh, to establish partnership and to see, you know, what is it that we can bring to help to move whatever it is forward. If we're doing justice, that justice has to be defined by the people who have been experiencing the injustice. And so that's the kind of accountability we're talking about. If, if accountability is coming from your sense of your corporate life or your work or whatever, then, you know, it's like you've got to do certain things to please the people who have the authority in the association. Our work in, in justice, it might include some of that, but that is not what centers accountability for us. So, and, and it would be specific, situational, right? So accountability in one situation is something different than accountability in another, but it's discovered in the collaboration and in the, um, in the outcomes. Are they satisfying our call to justice? Allie, do you want to respond to that? I Thank you, Paula. I, I, I hear like the two layers. It, for me, the relational aspect of it is is kind of the the centerpiece. It, and kind of back to this um, interconnectedness. How deep is our interconnectedness? How deep are we committing to be accountable, like in relationship with one another, interconnected? And you know, in in this context, in the context of environmental racism, of climate injustice, it, you know, it gets down to like, am I committed? to changing myself and my life and my community and our governance and economic structures so that you can survive, um, so that you don't have to live a life of, of struggle and, um, you know, like living 
at risk just as your baseline. Like that's unfortunately, like we've created systems that that perpetuate that on a global scale and it's being exacerbated because of the climate crisis. So we're seeing this play out with the UN climate talks that begin next week in the um, island, small island nations, these communities that if we aren't accountable to the commitments that we've made to keep global warming and climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius, some of these nations will be underwater. Um, so in that, that sense, you know, to be accountable to the global pledge on 1.5 degrees, um, I think it's, it's too, it gets diluted in the technical and, and, you know, like policy making process. But at the root of this, it's really, you know, on that spiritual level, like, are we committed to each other's lives and thriving? Um, so I see that as, um, kind of like that spiritual core of why environmental justice is important to Unitarian Universalism. It's also that that principle we have around equity and compassion in human relations. If we really want equity, then we need to change systems that um, make it so that the color of your skin is the biggest indicator on whether your community is polluted. Um, and that's you know the world we live in right now and it has to change. Yeah, let me give you another example of accountability. Um, and, and I'm tying this to something that uh, I feel a sense of urgency around now. And that is that I don't think we will ever get climate uh, change under control unless we are protecting the basic civil rights of people in this country. And we can look at that in terms of voting rights. And, and I wanna tie this to accountability because one, I don't know how much it has, we've examined it. And two, um, I think it's a difficult thing to look at. The restructuring of voting in this country, whether it's through, um, you know, changes in terms of the polls, who can get there, all of these rules and requirements, um, gerrymandering, all of those things that are really designed to stop people from going to the polls and target people of color, the BIPOC communities in particular, also catching up in that net, young people and older people and all, all of those things that are being done will stop people who will vote in the best interest of the common good. So we cannot do the work around climate change. We can't, we're not holding the country or our elected officials accountable to climate change if we ourselves are not accountable to making sure that everyone gets to vote. And I don't think we're doing that. I don't think we're doing that. And, and we can back it up and look at the election of, of 2000, voter disenfranchisement got a new structure and uh, that was also the same time that climate justice, environmental justice would have been brought forward as a national priority. So that was the election between George Bush and Al Gore. Al Gore had this as a priority. Voter disenfranchisement was very deliberately put in place and that stopped Gore from winning the election. So the climate change work went on the back burner. Why? Because we did not assure people's right to vote and assure that their votes counted. So we can trace it right back to 2000. And there are things that have been written about it. And if you take a look at what's happening now, how many years is that? 20 something years? And it's on steroids now. 
So let's talk about accountability under those circumstances. You've got climate change. You've got voting rights. You've got racism, which includes mass incarceration. That is also a way of controlling the electorate. All of those things come together. And yet we wonder, you know, we have the, I don't know, it's like, how how do we get climate control, um, climate change under control? We have to elect people who care enough to make that happen. Folks are working to make sure that will not happen, that those elections will not happen. So let me tone it down and come back to accountability. Are we being accountable to people whose voting rights are being taken away or threatened? And some are yes, but not enough of us are. And by the time we feel the sense of urgency, it'll be too late if it's not already too late. I rest my case. <laughs> It's hard. Paulo, it's hard to look at it. Yes, yes. I I struggle with a lot of hopelessness living in Texas. In what you're saying, Paula, in the lack of accountability, the lack of, um, you know, democracy <laughs> in our governance in Texas. Um, and so, I think earlier this week, Governor Abbott here in Texas signed the new gerrymandered voting districts. And maybe you saw this in the headlines, but 95% of the population growth in our state is among people of color. And somehow one fewer district is majority people of color in the new maps that Texas has just passed, you know, so it's so explicitly racist um, in what they did. And, you know, when you layer the climate story of what's happening in Texas on top of that, you know, February of 2020, of this year, 2021, we lost power and some people lost water. Some people lost their homes completely in a climate fueled winter storm. And the government of Texas was, you know, responsible for getting our energy grid to, to winterize. And it's come out recently that there's a loophole in the law that they've passed where a company, a gas company can file a paperwork with our, our railroad commission, which is actually what regulates pipelines and the energy infrastructure altogether, because they haven't updated the name in a few hundred years, I think. Uh, but the railroad commission of Texas will accept like $150 from a natural gas plant, and then they don't have to winterize, like for, you know, the cost of one catered lunch <laughs> in, in a corporate office. Um, they don't have to be accountable for keeping an energy grid that can, you know, power people's basic needs through through this, you know, rapidly changing climate change environmental context that we're in. So just to give an example of what Paul is saying, what the impacts of the, the dilution of our rights are, we feel it really um, starkly right now here in Texas. Um, and I do want to say, you know, just to speak to the You, You, The Vote campaign that we had last year, You, You, The Vote is not over. Um, there will be more efforts in 2022 pretty soon to, um, you know, continue what we can to um, connect these dots. And, you know, I think it's despite the hopelessness we may feel, you know, we can't just we can't just resign ourselves to like, okay, this is our reality. Our democracy's broken, our climate's broken, and you know, do what you can today. <laughs> you know, we have to balance living with um, joy and whatever hope we can find, um, but we can't just resign ourselves to this future um, because we are accountable to future generations as well. <laughs> We're accountable to life on this planet um, as well. And we do have um, we do have examples in our U.S. history of being able to do this work, right? To being able to pressure individual states into doing the right thing, even when they don't want to. And um, I think that you know we can look at the the 
you know, the work of the 60s of, you know, forcing the South to integrate and forcing, um, you know, from a federal standpoint, when we know an individual state is doing wrong, um, we do have an opportunity and, in, in, in my opinion, as, as faith leaders, a responsibility to put pressure on our federal government to take a look at what the states are doing and uh, enact legislation that that forces them to do the right thing. Um, and I know that that is, is difficult and it kind of goes against the, you can't make me do anything <laughs> um, uh, aesthetic of not just Unitarian Universalists, but uh, United States citizens uh, or United States residents. But I think it's, um, it's important that we, that we, Allie, what you said of just like throwing up our hands and saying, oh, there's nothing that we can do, you know, with Texas, Texas is going to be Texas, isn't really true. And it, and it somehow absolves us of feeling this urgency around doing the things that we can do. And, you know, it's interesting to me, the theological underpinning to this work is interdependence, right? So like, it needs to matter to me that the people of Palau will be underwater if we don't act because their fate and my fate are inter interdependent, right? We are, we are they, unless, unless we stop their nation from going underwater, like we have failed all of humanity has failed. Um, it matters to me in New York that injustice is happening in Texas because our our communities are interdependent um, or we need to theologically understand that interdependence. Um, and, you know, it matters that, you know, extinction is happening uh, with species all over the planet too, because our fates are interdependent. It matters what's happening in the ocean because of climate change and, and ocean warming because the oceans connect the whole planet. And so there's this theological piece under it that, that to me is interdependence. Um, that like my, and, and, my liberation yeah. and the liberation of the people in prisons are bound together inseparably. And and Michael to yes and to to further your point and it in the reason it matters that those places don't go underwater isn't because of what it means for us in you know e extreme weather and and climate change in our areas it matters because we cannot build heaven on earth knowing that that we're condemning entire societies to be underwater, right? We, we, we cannot claim, even if everything was fine, where we are fine, where we are, it doesn't matter. We're still not liberated if the least of us among us aren't liberated, right? And so a lot of times, I think in Unitarian Universalism, I hear environmentalism and climate change couched in, if we don't take care of them, that just means it's gonna be so much worse for us, right? And while that may be true, it's not the reason why we do this work, right? We do this work because we know that there before the grace of God goes I. And that, that privilege that has been given to us, we are obligated to use for others. Well, there's a so prevention. <laughs> <laughs> there's a prevention aspect of this too. Um, you know, I've been listening a little bit to you know this this idea about continual progress uh, that maybe sustainability does not require that. In fact, maybe continuous progress is a detriment to sustainability. Um, so, you know, I mean, people have a right to exist with a certain um, 
with a certain integrity, right? Of the environment and the community and the surrounding communities. Um, and of course, you all know the, the idea of community of communities is that communities can live and exist with, with their own cultural integrity. Um, if what we're doing puts that at risk, then we need to hold ourselves accountable um, for, um, for our actions. Uh, and because we, we live in a, in a capitalist you know, culture, uh, people's right to that kind of safety and integrity, it, it goes on the back burner. It's far less important than the idea of progress and and profits, uh, and that is just it, so destructive. It, Michael, you mentioned the oceans. Um, you see water behind me. I'm a scuba diver. My husband's marine biologist. We are destroying the oceans. Plastic, trash, pharmaceuticals. So it's not even just global warming. You know, it's it's what we're doing. And if you go beneath the water, there are just the most beautiful, delicate, fragile environments. And um, and you know, it's like we don't care. Out of sight, out of mind. Um, so we really do. Uh, we have a much bigger accountability than we have called ourselves to. And again, I, it goes back to me, to me over and over again in terms of this country, the right to vote makes all the difference in the world because public policy is the thing that we have a hard time fighting against, right? Once that policy is set, a lot of people are just kind of complacent and complicit in a sense that we don't do the work to turn those policies around. It does feel bigger than, it feels big and unmanageable, but if we manage the right to vote, then a lot of those things will become manageable. So if we're really smart about where we put our efforts, uh, we want to make sure that people's votes count so that people can vote in their best interest. One, one thing I want to mention, what Chris just said and what Paula just said brings me to the Create Climate Justice Initiative. That's our denominational call to do this work intersectionally. And one of our priorities is to catalyze the just transition to an ecological civilization. And there's many, many frameworks for what the just transition means. But the one that I always point to is from the Climate Justice Alliance. And maybe we can share this in the show notes. But the first principle of a just transition that they speak to is buen vivir, a good life. And um, they define that buen vivir means that we can live well without living better at the expense of others. Workers, community residents, women, and indigenous peoples around the world have a fundamental human right to clean, healthy, and adequate air, water, land, food, education, and shelter. We must have just relationships with each other and with the natural world of which we are a part. The rights of peoples, communities, and nature must supersede the rights of the individual. So um, this is one way that, that you can see these parallels between Unitarian Universalist values and the values of the climate justice movement that we are called to work with, align ourselves with, and be a part of. Um, so I just want to lift that up as one of the ways that we're doing the work together. Um, and I also want to mention the, um, here we are with 15 minutes left and we haven't talked about the BIPOC caucus for climate justice, Paula, that you're a co-convener of. Um, so I wondered if we might make a little time to speak to how you use of color are engaging, um, on, on this intersection of the eighth and seventh principles. 
We'll do that, but also uh, um, we might have an opportunity to address uh, a little more about the eighth principle. But let me say first that the, the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Caucus uh, of UNI uh, UU Ministry for the Earth, uh, the, it actually um, came together in, in a retreat that was done, what was that, spring 2018? spring of 2018 and UU Ministry for Earth, they, they wanted to do their work in a way that was creative, transformative, more inclusive. Um, and so we had a, a very strong caucus as a part of that retreat. And in, in the retreat, UU Ministry for Earth uh, adopted the eighth principle because I think we understood that we needed to kind of carve out um, another conceptual theological space for a full dialogue between us, right? So that happened, and UUMFE was one of the earliest adopters of the Eighth Principle. <clears throat> so we now have, um, we've been forming uh, a BIPOC caucus. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, we've got uh, a lot of representation of um, various uh, ethnic identities, cultural identities in the caucus. One of the things that I, uh, it was an, a kind of an aha moment for me, as we form this new caucus, the work of inclusion is like everything in the beginning. And what I, after 20 something years, what I realize is we really haven't done much of this work in our association. We come into spaces that already exist and we, we don't, we're not starting from the ground up to establish a, a truly multiculturally inclusive uh, community um, at the onset. And I think it's I think it's out of consciousness for people because the space is already there, and and I'm not sure that I would have even realized it without um, being in this role, starting a new group. So that's one thing is that we have a lot of learning to do as we adjust and transform culturally. Um, so that that's one piece. The eighth principle will help us to do that. And I am seeing in many different places where congregations are either working on the eighth principle, not just congregations, but other groups like you use for social justice and state action networks, but where they're either working to adopt the eighth principle or where they already have adopted the eighth principle. It's like we are gaining access to a realm of Unitarian Universalism that was in a sense kind of dormant, you know, just just like beyond, beyond the daily reach of people. And um, it's, it's really exciting. I think in the next three to five years, we are going to see and experience a transformation that uh, this, folks just aren't even ready for. And it'll be a good one. So, um, we have we have done as much as we could have done, right, within the context and with the principles centered as we've had them. The eighth principle calls us into a truly inclusive way of living out and applying those eighth principles, and we are just beginning that process. And I don't mean around the, you know, there of course there are exceptions, there are pockets. Uh, the work that Blue has done, the work that Drum has done, is definitely there. But in terms of, of what's central to the average Unitarian Universalist space, we are just stepping into a new realm. It's quite exciting. Um, two questions from, from some folks that are watching, uh, Darby and Natalie, and they're, they're kind of intersecting questions of, um, as congregations and communities uh, move to accept the eighth principle, what would they need to be doing 
um, what are some first steps that they could be doing to, to engage with this work, not just from an environmental perspective, but from a race perspective and understanding the intersectionality between race and environment. And, and, and the other um, oppressions as well. We focus a lot on race because, I mean, at, at this moment in history, the, the urgency around it is just um, tangible. Everyone, everyone knows that we're in that kind of moment. Um, so it, it's important to introduce it in your congregation where you bring more and more people into the conversation so that the time between when you suggest the eighth principle and that you actually schedule it for a vote, people have had a chance to explore their own thoughts and feelings, hear from other people. And, and it's an important period for um, awareness and people being, um, being, being able to hear why it's important and, and how other people feel about it. So we have more than just our own reactions. Some people's initial reactions are like, you know, we don't need that. Why do we need it? We have the seven principles. Well, yeah, for many people who are already here, they don't need the eighth principle, right? Some of us do. And we all do, whether we are aware of it or not. And so you have to give people a chance to have that initial reaction and then hear more and give and have consideration. That's one piece. I think you want to work with your board and your ministers. You want your church leadership to be on board. They don't have to lead the process, but they you want their support for it. And you know, what does it take to get a resolution passed in your congregation? It's different in different congregations. Uh, so you've got timing issues, you've got to get on agendas and all of those things that you need to do uh, to make it happen. Once you, once you take your vote, of course you let us know so we can add you to the list. <laughs> That's important. But um, you, we need to be thinking about once the eighth principle is uh, embraced by our congregation or our organization, then what does it mean when we begin to look at our work and our relationships through that eighth principle? Does your mission need to change? Does your covenant need to be rewritten? Probably yes, right? Is your vision for the church different, right? What about your, your policies and your practices? If you're in a congregation, you've got worship and religious education and every aspect of the church needs to then be reconsidered with the eighth principle as a part of your lens. Now, there may be things that don't change, but I'm willing to bet you that there's room for a lot of change. We have an eighth principle learning community that meets monthly. Again, this work is very young. Uh, and those changes that we're talking about, we're going to discover in time. But the learning community meets monthly. I encourage you to get on the mailing list so that you can come to those meetings. They're great, they're resources. Uh, we get to learn from each other. Those who have already passed it, those who are working on governance, those who have exciting things happening in, uh, in, um, in religious education and worship. And you know, something I've thought about, I would love to do assimilation. I'm putting out one of those ideas that's too early to put out, but. I would love to do a, a assimilation of a congregation, not brick and mortar, not real, but assimilation of a congregation where the eighth principle has been applied across the board. If we can kind of create, you know, what that model might look like, then I think it'll it'll help inform a lot more people. But um yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, as, as we head toward the end of our show, are there ways that UU Ministry for the Earth um, particularly can help congregations um, engage with the Eighth Principle? Um, because I, I know lots of our congregations are passionate about environmental issues, if not yet environmental justice, because they don't 
quite get <laughs> quite get the difference between those. But I'm wondering if there are ways that UU Ministry for the Earth can help those congregations that already embrace the seventh principle so much um, make make that connection uh, more easily and, and more directly. Absolutely. So um, there's a few tools and resources that I'll begin with. Um, the BIPOC Caucus for Climate Justice of UU Ministry for Earth has meetings that are open to anybody, regardless of, you know, white people too can come and participate in the conversation. The next one will be in January. That's a multicultural program open to anyone. And these are spaces, you know, it's important that those people who have been marginalized for centuries are centered um, as part of what it means to pass the eighth principle. So um, showing up for those BIPOC caucus programs that you're invited to and welcome to come to is one way to begin. Your, your whole climate or green sanctuary team is welcome to come and then to talk about it and debrief it together. We also have a curriculum that was published about 10 years ago. Hopefully we'll release a, a new edition soon, but it's called Our Place in the Web of Life. And this cur curriculum is focused on looking at where your church is, where your power comes from, where your waste goes to, and whose communities are being impacted by the coal power plant, where the coal comes from, and starting to see um, the life of your church, how it is connected to other communities and to environmental justice issues. And then the next step from there is how do you actually meet the organizers in those communities? Um, how do you actually meet the people who are trying to transform your energy grid so that that coal plant doesn't pollute that community anymore? And um, I'll, I'll just say relationship is so key. Like you will never fully understand environmental racism if you're not in relationship to people who are experiencing it, who are suffering because of it. And so if, um, you know, a congregation, like I, I know many congregations will think we don't have any EJ communities near us. Um, that's probably not true. <laughs> you know, they're, you just don't know about them yet. Um, and yeah, they may be small and they may be struggling because of a really big history of genocide, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. And, um, you know, maybe you have to drive an hour but I know uh, a chief of a tribe that I work with would drive 12 hours across the country to be at a gathering uh, before the pandemic. And it, I, I just, it reframed my, my thinking around this. Like, what are we willing, how, how far are we willing to go? Um, how deep is our commitment to one another? And to see someone who was willing to drive across the entire continent to be at a gathering when so many of us are like, oh, they live across the river. Um, you know, it, it just really is uh, something to question in ourselves, something to unpack in terms of, um, you know, what are the real barriers to our connection? Um, and then what are the ones that we're imposing by our comfort, <laughs> you know? Um, so th that's kind of where I would start. There's also the Justice on Earth book that Paul is one of the contributing authors to. There's a discussion guide for that that was published by the UUA. Um, and please join Ministry for Earth's newsletter. We have workshops, webinars, convergences of congregational leaders all the time, you know, so we would love to continue to build and, and be in relationship as we grow and deepen our, our commitment to the eighth principle within how we do environmental and climate work. Thanks so much. Paula, any, any last moments? Any no, last? This a, I'm sorry, Christine. This is a no. good time to revive. Um, uh, seventh principle uh, groups in congregations uh, because if they are start to look at the seventh principle and the eighth principle together they're going to have new revelations new work to do well thank you both so much for being here today i feel like we could have a whole nother hour <laughs> on this conversation so i really appreciate like condensing everything into into this one hour. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for our guests, um, Allie and Paula. 
Thanks, Michael, for being here. And of course, always behind the chalice is Tanner Linden, who keeps us looking good and uh, getting our voices out there. We will see you next week, same time, same place. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Special thanks to those of you who give generously to this ministry. It is because of you that this ministry is possible. You can click the link in the description to give now or visit clfuu.org backslash give for more information. We hope you will join us next week for another episode of The View.